They were a tight-knit band, the Farlows of Beatrice, Nebraska. In fact, they were a band. There was Alfred, the oldest on tuba, brothers Will and George on cornet, sisters Sarah and Stella on tenor horn, Emma and Mary on baritone horn, and little Maggie on drum, all led by their dad, William, who in addition to being a farmer, store proprietor, and local official, was a music teacher. The Farlows had moved to Nebraska from Illinois after their dad's failed business venture forced Alfred to leave college and all the Farlows had to pitch in to support the family. Alfred and his brother Will, in the entrepreneurial spirit of the time, started a factory to convert local reeds into brooms. Finding no orchestra in the frontier town, the music-loving family started their own. The Farlow family band was the general favorite. Their open-air concert from the veranda of the lodge building was a rare musical treat. When the Farlows discovered Christian science, they did it the same way they did everything else, as a family. According to Will Farlow's daughter, Dorothy, a neighbor who was practically a confirmed invalid and who had tried almost every conceivable kind of treatment and medicine suddenly left town. She remained away for several weeks. When she returned, she was almost a well woman. Dorothy Farlow. The neighbor had brought from Omaha a copy of Science and Health, which was then in two volumes. The idea of Christian healing through prayer vitally interested Mother Farlow, and she brought one of the volumes home for her family to read. Will Farlow recalled how the book was put in his hands in the days when he and Alfred were running the broom factory. That day I did as I was in the habit of doing occasionally, swearing off a smoking habit. About four o'clock in the evening, I gave up my work and went home, feeling too much overcome by my desire for the weed to do any more work. Will's mother brought him the volume of Science and Health, telling him this book was supposed to heal those who read it. Well, in less than a fortnight, all desire for tobacco had left me as free as if I had never used it. Will Farlow. Alfred was of a somewhat darker frame of mind. He recalled, I contracted a disease that threatened me with death in a few years. And as most people do under such circumstances, I also contracted a fear of eternal damnation. I had become very unhappy, full of doubts and fears, and skeptical even of the truths of the Bible. The mental darkness increased until I grew desperate. Alfred Farlow. At that point, the Christian scientist in Omaha who had treated the Farlow's neighbor moved to a house next door to the Farlow's. At his mother's suggestion, Alfred went to her for help. I placed myself under treatment, but I found it, at first, hard to understand. One day, driving across the western prairie, in company with my friends who were discussing the question, I saw for the first time the idea of divine science, that man is, not shall be, God's own likeness, forever saved, and that only a seeming darkness hides that fact. The change for which I had labored had come. With Alfred's healing, the entire Farlow family seized on Christian science. Our whole family took up its study together, father, mother, and eight children. We gathered around the dining room table in the evenings, the only table large enough for the whole family to gather around, to study the new religion. As they studied Mrs. Eddy's book, the Farlows learned that a Christian scientist who had been taught by Mrs. Eddy would be holding classes in their town. Janet Coleman and her husband were on their return trip to the Midwest to heal and teach. In May 1886, her class in Beatrice contained four Farlows, Alfred, Sarah, Emma, and Will. After seven lessons, Mrs. Coleman told her students to go out, find a patient, and test their understanding. Will Farlow's young neighbor had a severe gash over his eye caused by a flying wood chip 
Will asked him if he might help him through prayer. He looked at me rather incredulously and said that I might. The next day I hunted him up and when I asked him about his wound, he put his hand up to his eye and found there was not even a mark left. He had completely forgotten about it. The happiness and peace that I experienced, I had never had before. A man from Illinois recalled that during this period, Alfred treated his father for consumption. My father had lost his mother, a brother, and two sisters with consumption. He found himself going the same way. Alfred had come back to his old neighborhood in Illinois to visit and spread the good news around. The healing, when it came, was instantaneous. The consumption fell off him like an outworn garment. T.B. Anderson. The Farlows went ahead with their Christian science practice in the face of opposition and disdain from others, including a worker at their own broom factory who quit in protest. As Will tells it, He came back in about two years with a severe fever, and I had the pleasure of healing him through my understanding of Christian science, for I had, in the meantime, taken a course of instructions from our beloved teacher, Mrs. Eddy. One year after their class with Janet Coleman, at her urging, Alfred and Will had gone to Boston for Mrs. Eddy's primary class. Two years later, 1889, the last primary class she would teach at the college was also the largest. Four Farlows, Alfred, Sarah, Will, and Emma, were among the nearly 70 students. Mrs. Eddy told them all, We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind. You are going out to demonstrate a living faith, a true sense of the infinite good, a sense that does not limit God, but brings to human view an enlarged sense of deity. The Farlow family were among those rising to this formidable challenge. Alfred and Will closed their broom factory and launched full-time into the practice of Christian science healing. Soon they moved to Topeka and formed the Kansas Christian Science Institute. Alfred began writing letters to news editors answering attacks on Christian science. Jumping aboard the modern mode of rail travel, the Farlow brothers went on the road to pioneer towns, lecturing to audiences large and small. In some places, Alfred held public debates on Christian science, responding to criticisms by clergymen or physicians. Will traveled from hotel to hotel in town after town, advertising informal talks about Christian science in rented hotel parlors. Dorothy Farlow recalled her father's parlor talks. There were times when only one or two people came, other times nine or ten. And numerous times there were so many he would arrange for the use of the schoolhouse or town hall. Healings followed in the wake of these travels. Will put up a notice for one of his talks in the post office of a town where he was staying. A customer looked it over skeptically, then went up to Will and demanded, can your Christian science heal this? Pointing to his own crippled arm. As Dorothy tells it, my father assured him it could. Whereupon the man replied, all right, you pray for me, and if you heal my arm, I'll come and hear you talk. The man seemed more belligerent and defiant than seeking, but my father decided he had been asked for a treatment, and he would give it. That evening, as Will got up to speak, the man from the post office strode in, grabbed Will's hand, and pumped it up and down vigorously, thanking him. He was using the same arm that had been limp and useless that morning. Due to work like this by the Farlow brothers and a growing number of others, Christian science groups and churches were springing up all over the American West. In 1895, the older Farlow brothers moved their practice to Kansas City. Naturally, the entire Farlow family moved with them. Together, they helped found Kansas City Mission Church with Alfred as pastor and just 17 members, most of whom were Farlows. And naturally, being mainly Farlows, those 17 voices made music. In less than a year, by all reports, the voices of Kansas City Mission Church grew to over 500.
Alfred Farlow organized the Committee on Publication, working tirelessly to correct errors in the media about Christian Science and Mrs. Eddy. Alfred's brother Will, with a steady healing practice, settled in Los Angeles with his wife Ina to join in the rapid growth of Christian Science in California. Throughout the busy careers of all these people, healing was at the center of their work. Alfred Farlow's healing practice was typical. When he retired in 1914 and prepared to join his brother and sister-in-law on the West Coast, Alfred packed letters from his patients over the years. His sister recalled the letters were pinned together in pairs, each letter asking for healing, pinned to a letter of thanks for the healing received. The letters filled a trunk. <laughs> 